Hi everyone, welcome back to the Glass of Hans CSW study sprint. Uh, today we'll be covering Viticulture chapter 4. Uh, because of how long this topic is, so I split it up into two parts. Part 1, focusing on just the vine itself. And then part 2, focusing on what happens in the vineyard. Now before I begin, I do apologize for this really long absence between this chapter and the previous one. Life got just a little bit busy, but i um, glad to be jumping back on the bandwagon and creating content till the last chapter. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's start with some basics. The vine in its cultivated form has a simple but complex structure. Now what that means is in the wild, the vine looks completely different. It doesn't take any specific form or shape. It grows as it does in the wild. But in the vineyard, below ground, the roots are far more vast than what we see above. Often, it, this can extend up to 20 or 30 meters deep. The roots, which are essential for the vine's survival, actually pull water and nutrients from deep within the soil. Above ground, the trunk serves as the primary support, maturing from a, just a simple little stick to a sturdy tree-like pillar as we see in many vineyards as the years go by. Now, emerging from that trunk, what we see are branches or arms. Initially, these appear as small spurs, but with time, the spurs grow into what we call canes, the young slender offshoots of the vine. Now, not all of these canes get to live a long life. Most actually are pruned annually, but those few that are still allowed to grow further evolve into cordons, the thicker, more prominent arms of the vine, not related to James Corden. So why prune? Left to its own devices, the vine, just like it is in the wild, can become a tangled mess of canes. Now, this doesn't just look untidy, but impacts the vine's health and productivity of grapes. While most commonly, vineyards encourage a simple one or two arm structure, there are places where these vines may exhibit form even more limbs. And the key is consistent pruning and training. It's a lot of work in the vineyard, but it has to be done constantly. The canopy, which is a term we use to describe the seasonally productive portion of the vine, encompasses both the leaves and grape bunches. These elements together form a protective and nourishing environment essential for grape development. So what are grapes then? I know it may seem like a very obvious question, but they really are ultimately vessels for seeds. In the early stages, the green skin camouflages them, that's why they appear green at first, and the acidic taste of the pulp keeps them safe from consumption. These little green berries are very, very acidic, more acidic than, say, getting green grapes from the supermarket. But nature is a way of signaling when it's time for these seeds to spread. As the seeds mature, the grape skin changes from an attractive red or gold, and its pulp becomes sweet and juicy. This transformation not only attracts birds and animals, but also indicates when the grape is ripe and its peak for harvest. So in the wild, grapes spread their lineage using seeds. But while this method does lead to a vast range of genetic variations, it's an unpredictable and slow process, often with a large percentage of seeds failing to become robust grapevines. For commercial vineyards, that's just a no-go, right? So cloning is the preferred method of propagation. By taking a cutting from a healthy, desired grapevine and letting it root, we can ensure a genetically identical offshoot. This ensures predictable characteristics and a higher success rate compared to using seeds. So when you go to a vineyard, and again, there are exceptions, but most vineyards are using the exact same clone throughout the entire vineyard. There's another form of propagation known as field grafting. This is often done uh, partially, uh, where, for example, you have a plant that you want to replace, but you don't want the root uh, stock to get removed. So picture an existing vineyard growing an unwanted grape variety. Let's say you want to grow Riesling, but what you have is Chardonnay. So if the root system is still healthy, you can actually graft a new desired grape variety onto it. This gives the new cutting immediate access to an established root network promoting faster growth. 
Though vines may start bearing fruit early, patience is the key in viticulture, like many other things in life. Grapes from the first two seasons are often below the desired quality, leading vineyard managers to remove them. This allows the young vine to focus on structural growth. It's around the third year, or known as third leaf, that grapes worthy of winemaking appear. In fact, based for regulatory reasons, there are some appellations around the world which would not allow even the first two seasons of grapes to be used in wine winemaking. These grapes are often just sold off to be distilled into hard liquor or something like that. However, for the premium quality grape, one really needs to wait until the vine is at least about six years old. There are certain vineyards in Burgundy that would not bottle their vines uh, until maybe the 15th or 20th year. Uh, before that, they would just declassify them. So as grapevines age, they do become a testament to time and endurance. Post this 20-year mark, while the vigor may diminish, the quality of the grapes can continue to rise. Grapes from these elder statesmen, if you will, of the vineyard are often used to produce the revered so-called old vine wines. This term isn't strictly regulated, generally speaking, although there are appellations that do govern this. Uh, and a lot of these uh, vines can be as old as 50 years or more. Impressively, some of these 100-year-old vines, although fewer in yield, continue to produce grapes of outstanding quality, but it is a trade-off between quality and quantity, which every commercial uh, vineyard owner needs to consider. So where is vine grown? Actually, it's grown all around the world, but it predominantly flourishes in temperate climates, specifically between 30 and 50 degrees latitude in both hemispheres. Although you can find wine grown nearer to the equator where the altitude is really, really high. Here, the seasonal variations offer optimal conditions for the grapevine's annual growth cycle. Now remember, due to the Earth's tilt, the northern and southern hemispheres experience opposite seasons, leading to staggered harvests approximately six months apart. As spring sets in, no matter whether you're in the uh, northern or southern hemisphere, and the ground temperatures rise, the grapevine actually awakens from its winter slumber. The initial weeping phase, the word here, is a fascinating sight with sap flowing upwards, hinting at the vitality beneath. Shortly after, what we see is bud break as tiny shoots of buds emerge. However, this period isn't without risks. Newly formed buds are extremely susceptible to temperature extremes, especially late frosts, which can be detrimental. And that is very key to remember for the exam. Now, as suits mature, they unfurl into leaves, tapping into the previous year's stored energy. With leaves fully formed, photosynthesis kicks in, providing fresh energy and spurring faster growth. Within one to two months post bud break, the grapevines will flower, um, Great flowers are nothing pretty to look at. What you see on the slide is example of grape flowers. Um, these clusters of tiny flowers are potential grape progenitors. Notably, grapevines self-pollinate, relying on breezes for pollination rather than bees. So you don't need the uh, typical insects and, or animals to help pollinate the plants. Following successful pollination, what we will witness is berry set, the transformation of flowers into the earlier stages of grapes. But nature isn't always that accommodating. Wet or windy conditions can inhibit, sorry, can inhibit pollination, leading to a reduced crop. And additionally, growers must be wary of conditions such as Kulua, which is where flowers don't develop into berries, and Millerandage, where uneven berry development occurs within the same cluster. Uh, again, I'm sure I'm not necessarily pronouncing these terms right, but they will come up during the exams. The next significant phase is veraison. Think of it as adolescence for grapes, a period of rapid change. Red grapes start acquiring their characteristic hue, while white grapes undergo a more subtle transformation. But it's not just about the visuals. Internally, the grapes are busy storing sugar, moderating their acidity, and maturing their seeds. So the final stretch is really the harvest. 
The challenge is deciding the optimal harvest time when both sugar levels as well as phenolic maturity are in harmony. This period can span anywhere from 110 to 200 days after bud break. Factors such as grape variety and regional climate heavily influence this decision, which makes every harvest a unique experience. So it's not necessarily a set timeline in every single year. Now, after you've harvested, the leaves have fallen off, the autumn chill deepens and the vine begins its preparation for the cold months ahead. Sensing the dropping temperature, it retreats, pulling sap into its trunks and shedding its leaves. This natural safeguard ensures minimal damage from frost. Following this, growers step in, pruning back the year's growth and thus shaping the vine's potential for the coming year. So really, there's no time of the year where the vineyard manager can actually take a break. Work is constantly happening, even in winter. And with that, we cover the vine section of this chapter. But I thought what would be interesting is that we also look at a couple of uh, sample exam questions. So one question, which process in grapevine metabolism is responsible for converting sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into sugar? The correct answer is, of course, the photosynthesis, which is the process where plants take in sunlight along with carbon dioxide and turns it into sugar. Now, this is an easy question, so let's move on to the next one, which might be a little bit trickier. When does the cycle of grape growth actually begin? And the answer in this case is C, with the emergence of new greenery in the spring. Basically, when the ground temperature consistently rises above a certain temperature at 10 degrees Celsius. Now, this is an interesting point because the key word here is consistently. If often what actually happens is where the temperature goes above a certain temperature, but then it drops again, sometimes the vine can be tricked into thinking that spring has come early and then starts putting out its buds, but actually hasn't come yet, and then the frost destroys the buds. So, this is a pretty interesting point to remember. The next question is quite an easy one. In which latitude is wine growing most successful? Uh, and the answer is B, 30 to 50 degrees. Next up, we have this question. What is the main benefit of field grafting over using rooted cuttings? Now, this is getting a little bit trickier. And the answer in this case is B, where the cutting instantly gets access to an extensive root network. That's the advantage of field grafting, and it is used pretty actively in a lot of vineyards, but uh, this is not the main method of commercial propagation. Finally, why is growing grapevines from seeds considered not suitable for commercial viticulture? Take a while to think, and the answer is A because seeds produce very unpredictable genetic variations. And with that, we have come to the end of part one of chapter four. Uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed the new presentation format and also the inclusion of sample exam questions. If uh, you guys want to see more exam questions, uh, please reach out to me at my email address, hans at glassofhans.com. And I will see you in the next part of this chapter. Thank you.